at and and now it's the Cross Bank uh, Center. Uh, go back a little bit. I'm sorry. Um, the, um, and it was constructed, I said this off already, but the home of the Spurs, and we know now the rodeo is using, uh, not using, right now. but it's, it's rodeo season. So, so two things, you go from, from a basketball court to dirt, and then you have to uh, revamp back to, to the Spurs arena. Uh, next slide. Uh, as we said, it was a renovation. It, it, this is why probably the first time, it's only two times that I would, that I was expecting and I wanted the Spurs to lose and lose quick. <laughs> First time, and I, I, I have, I must say that I have, there's a punchline, so don't, don't. <laughs> that down. The first time was 2016 when the renovation was taking place because there was a schedule that was not going to move. This project had to be completed before the se the preseason, the next preseason game. So you finished your season in 2016 and then you know preseason starts you know what is october whatever and you have to get so the spurs were in the first round of the playoffs and they won the first round and no. we're sitting up there saying oh wait a minute <laughs> are they gonna win a championship this is gonna be tough so the second round came and i think uh they lost the okc uh in six six games so uh they turned the project over to the CMAR, which was um, um, a Acom Hunt, and they took it on from there. But uh, $110 million renovation um, was a P3 consisting of the Bear County, the uh, Community Arena Board, uh, the uh, Stock Show, San Antonio Stock Show, and uh, the Spurs, uh, the Sports uh, uh, and Entertainment. Uh, next slide. And I talk, I mentioned that this was a project delivery of CMAR. Uh, developer was the um, SSNE, this is Spurs uh, Sports and Entertainment. And um, when it came about, the, the, the actual goal, which really was considered a goal because we really didn't have a disparity study. So re no, basically it was, a goal. An, it, it, was, it was a goal that was aspirational goal. And they needed someone to make that happen, and TJ's company, uh, they hold a uh, construction management, was the selected firm, and TJ took that to the next level, and uh, that's why we're here to talk about his. Uh, and it's very passionate. When we did this in D.C., I learned more about how his passion came because it has a family, uh, his family involvement uh, over the history of his dad was what really propelled him to really put emphasis on this and, and doing a great, successful job. As we said, Spurs lost, um, uh, and then we went into a four and a half month completion. The second time that I was hoping they would lose is all last season, because I wanted that ping pong ball to get in the first. My, I, I shared the season tickets with a guy, and he was saying, man, why do you want them to lose? I said, man, they're going to get the number one pick. And he said, that. You're crazy, man. There's no. And when that happened, he called me. He said, "You must something. What, what did you have?" <laughs> uh, uh, in there, but that was only the second. The other time, we we going all the way. All right. <laughs> but that's all I have. I'm gonna hand it over to TJ. TJ, well, if you can take it from here. All right. Thank, Thank you, Paul. So it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for joining. Um, like Paul said, it, it's a story that it's it, it, in my mind is a continuum of a lot of things. You know, continuum of our relationship, my relationship with Paul. He's one of the first uh, minority firm owners that I ever met in the industry on my very first project when I first started. And so when I was a wee CM, he helped you know mentor me from that point on. So he saw saw my career development in those years. Um, and as we know, all these programs have a structured path and they have a program and they have some kind of uh, structure, but it's kind of a structure, but it's kind of like this image, you know, it's there, but it's not. And you got to kind of feel your way through the program and everybody says, well, just do the best you can, but we need you to meet this metric. And so it can be a little frustrating because, well, how do I get to that ultimate metric, you know? Um, 
So the program was actually established as far as the diversity program that uh, Renee Watson administers was actually implemented a little bit after the project had already started a project level diversity program, if I understand it correctly. As you said, Peter Holt and the leadership of the Spurs kind of that project spurred the need and the identi identity of needing a program. So the program came about about a year later. And they had some initial uh, project uh, aspirations as a program. And then uh, we also are supported in our community by South Central Texas Regional Certification Agency, which certifies for a lot of different reasons and a lot of different programs. But it, it's one of our partner organizations in our community. So big shoes. So San Antonio likes Fiesta, and you know when we ask our Fiesta queens to show us your shoes, and so um, those shoes have a little bit of symbolism about my father, San Antonio, the Penner, Stacy's white stitch shoes, you know that whole era of family and the generation in San Antonio. So if you're from San Antonio, you know who Penner's is, and you know those shoes. Uh, but I had big shoes to fill, um, as Paul said. There's a legacy, and there's a timing thing that occurred personally. Uh, around the time that I got this opportunity as a contractor to do the support work on the facility, I lost my father. And so it brought to mind a lot of what the legacy is that I carry as a community member. I am a diversity firm as represented by my heritage here and my company's profile at the time. My family comes from the missions, sec part of my family's second generation, second generation immigrant but they also come out of the missions. So I'm native to San Antonio territory as indigenous families. And then my family has a tremendous military background and knowing my father's history, found out that he was one of the prototype mechanics that worked on the F-100 engine, which was for the F-16, F-15 engine. Uh, he was a Central Catholic graduate, just like I was out of San Antonio. Uh, he was a high school dropout. A lot of legacy things I could share about that, but bottom line was, being in that specific environment changed his life. And so when I went through his records, I found something that I had always heard across the kitchen tables at family functions and the story that was repeated and repeated and repeated. But I found this letter in his service records from uh, civil service. And it's written by Henry B. Gonzalez when he was congressman. I've worked on that project twice for the building that's in his name for the Henry B. Gonzalez Convention Center. And it was focused with a bit of a community challenge where Minority employees of the federal government were transitioning to a civil service pay structure here in San Antonio, and it was at Kelly Air Force Base, and there was discriminatory practices felt by the community of derating the value of the employee as they went into that pay structure. And my father, among a handful of other men, went to Congressman Gonzalez and petitioned to him to make change. In the end, evaluations for the entire base were thrown out that year. They delayed the implementation of the pay structure and they made everybody get reevaluated before they went into the new job classifications. So even though this isn't contracting and this isn't, but it's a very impactful time in his life. So that happened that I found that legacy in his files. So that's little me. My dad was always making me do things. So I was holding up the space shuttle. I think that was the <laughs> The challenger when it came to uh, Kelly Air Force Base and I got taken out of school. The only time I remember being taken out of school for a personal reason and he took me to the runway and I got to go hold up the space shuttle. But we all have challenges, but he always inspired me to think bigger. So in general, we have specific challenges in meeting requirements and expectations, how to create an outreach program or present to the community. Uh, procurement, transparency, and reporting, that's sometimes challenging. The community advocacy part of it, and how does that look, and what tone does that make as far as how it's received? And then ultimately there's biases or discrimination that comes along with that role. And just to highlight a lot of things we try to do is make these programs relevant to the project. As we all know in our CM practices, our clients deliver projects through P3, through CMAR, through um, design build, integrated delivery, all these other things, but these programs don't really take that into context. They just know that they want you to meet a metric. So you gotta kind of marry that program into how does it 
create a solution to meet that that goal. The then just trying to figure out how far do you want to tear it down? How far do you want to report? How far do you want to go through a reporting process and getting that feedback through a chain of subcontractors and tiered subcontractors? So all of that presents challenges and we had to kind of set that baseline up front. Uh, establishing reporting frequency and a lot of that was more about the stakeholders and the people that you had to report to, not just the funders, which was the county, not just the SPURS organization as the owner, but also uh, stakeholder boards and advisory uh, organizations. So after we did all that, we figured out that 64% of the overall funding was eligible and we kind of segregated some of the ineligible activities being uh, professional stadium, state of the art, world-class uh, components in the building. Some things are just not eligible or how do you break apart a jumbotron that's worth $10 million? You can't really break it apart to get diversity because it's one bought component. So you had to kind of put some realistic goals to the metrics. And how does that weigh into the numbers that you end up with? We had the fortune of having the Spurs procurement organization, which Daniel's here representing, of having a legacy of continued community engagement and outreach to procurement in the organization to the diversity community. It's not just a program project goal, it's part of their culture as an organization. So when I stepped into those shoes, I was stepping in with their procurement team to help build on that. So we did about five months of pre-engagement before we even started the project. So not all projects have that opportunity. So I, I recognize that I was fortunate to have that. There was also a lot of direct appointment access. The Spurs were very cognitive of making sure that if a constituent in the community wanted access, that I made sure to make a follow-up appointment one-on-one -on -one with them to respond to that need and bring any opportunity or any engagement that we could to the table. Some of those opportunities were not on the project. Sometimes the Spurs will walk away from that opportunity and make a project for that opportunity for a, a shirt vendor or a small GC that did a dumpster pad replacement or something they needed somewhere else. They just didn't fit the profile of the project. Um, and again, it's, 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 it's just integrated in the culture of Spurs sports and entertainment as far as how they operate. Transparency, that was very hard a lot of times because it's always seen as only coming from one direction. And that transparency came from multiple directions on the project, not just from me, not just from the Spurs, not just from the county. Everybody had access to the same information and we all had multiple ways of communicating that information to the community, community that was being served. So there was a lot of upfront discussion of uh, fulfillment of this program before it was awarded. And actually, we'll get into that part of it. Finding places for participation, which I mentioned earlier. Creating capacity with the county and other creative structures to have JVs or parsing up the project to the point where it was painful for the for the team lead of the CMAR team of Hunt, uh, ACOM to do, but it was an initiative. And so we broke up some of the packages painfully to make opportunities, uh, especially in demolition. We could have had one demolition contractor. I think we ended up with seven or eight, but we broke up the site and broke up strategic areas for isolation, safety, responsibility, all that stuff. And just pairing and vetting small businesses. One of the hardest things I think for a team to do in the community when they're representing small business work is to have difficult, challenging and upfront conversations about are you the right fit for this project and turning somebody away respectfully. Being a member of that community, I was able to have those engagements and, and allow them to self select out of the program because you start asking them about their capacity, about their lines of credit, about their operational structure, about their ownership structure, about their uh, performance history, about their capacity, all these things. And then they kind of start processing what it's going to take to actually work on this first program like this for a project that's very prominent in the community. So bringing a lot of that understanding to the table so that they had an ability to decide whether it was something they really were prepared to pursue and be a part of because failure was not an option. The deadline could not move and there was huge penalties to be paid if we didn't make the preseason. 
community advocacy, just direct advocating, advocating uh, to the community in a lot of different ways and being accountable for that follow up. So anytime there was an engagement, anytime there was a request, I also had to report back what were the outcomes? What was the engagement like? How was it received? Was there any follow up actions expected from the county, from us, from Hunt, ACOM, from the Spurs, whoever it was, like who's taking the ball and moving it forward or has it been resolved and we don't have anything to do? Again, intentional discussions about business counseling and other things about fitting the right team to the project. And having open constituent representatives, boards and committees, those were all available during the project to the point where we had an actual project board committee to air grievances out at the project level. So we actually had a stakeholder team of the uh, CM for the county, which was Turner. We had the uh, Spurs CM who was uh, Icon, CAA Icon, and then of course a, uh, ACOM Hunt, and then myself, and we would sit in the room and any grievances were brought to a panel of the project and we had to kind of preside over what were the next steps to get it to the right solution. In one case, it was actually parting ways of that minority firm with the prime because it was just a bad pairing and there was just a lot of neg bad, bad energy and negative influence going on and we just needed to vet it out and make everything work out. Discrimination I think is always uh, has a lot of different contexts, not just racial discrimination. It felt hard to hear conversations with these national prominent firms saying San Antonio doesn't have the caliber of contractors that we want to have, not just minority contractors or partners or teaming partners to provide the level of services because we're a world class organization. We can't work with your firms in San Antonio. No, and then I would challenge back. Really, you don't do logistics of transport. You don't do craning, lifting, hoisting. You don't hire personnel in the local market. You know, so I went down the list and they're like, well, yeah, but then I got to find those. I said, well, I already did that. So let me bring them to you and then you work with them and figure out if you have a contracting relationship. So we added numbers to the world-class seating vendor, the Jumbotron, all these firms added to the numbers. They didn't be, they weren't held to the same metric, but they actually were a bonus to the project because they added to the numbers that we were considering eligible. They were on the ineligible side and we dragged some of those numbers over directly. So that was a hundred percent win for the project because any dollars we spent on the ineligible side was a hundred percent participation on the eligible side. And then you do all that. And then I'm the pole in the middle and everything's failing because nobody's doing the wrong thing for the wrong reason. Most of us in the, or I would say a lot of us in the profession are doing a lot of the right things for our, our firms or our respective roles in the project that we have to do because we're, we're trying to bring the right thing and the right solution to the table. You know, risk, timing, personnel, capacity, all that stuff. But then the diversity program was being forgotten because the the biggest poll in the room was we have this time risk and we got to get done so we can worry about diversity later. We just need to get under contract. But I couldn't get answers about the diversity program before we got under contract. So I represented that program, but I was at the table not able to provide any information and respectfully as contracts and ethics of our profession is, you know, we have a code of ethics, whether I'm working for a contractor, I'm working for an owner or whatever. We operate under our own code of ethics and my personal integrity. And I couldn't sit at the table endorsing the process. And so the Spurs recognized that the procurement lead at the time called me after the meeting and said, what's wrong? And I, I couldn't say. I said, why? And he said, well, you're not yourself. You were in the meeting and you were answering the questions, but you weren't saying anything. I said, right. I said, but you do realize I work for a client. I'm a, I have a client that I have to honor. And he said, well, then what's wrong? And I said, well, all I can tell you is you have the information that you need to ask questions on. You need to really dig into the information you have at hand and come to the table with better questions. At that point, I was ready to leave the project because I had been frustrated with not being able to influence the decision making around diversity. Without me, there was a meeting that happened. 
the outcome of the meeting was the whole project team got restructured. I now no longer reported to the project team. I reported to our general superintendent of the project who happened to be a principal of Hunt before it was bought to, brought into ACOM. So he had standing within the organization. And he said, you now report to me as a strategic leader of this company, and I will make the right decisions within our project to make diversity a priority in our decision making. So the Spurs refused to sign the contracts, and it took about two to three more weeks to get to the start of the contracts before we could get all those commitments financially. It was a tough position to be in. That role is a diversity small business, not yet being paid, working four months, and then saying, we gotta wait and not get paid still and not get under contract because everything's wrong. So we get to the finish line, which that's little me. I've always been in pictures by myself. My dad said he had no idea why I was racing in 100 yard dashes because I was not an athletic youth. And every one of my pictures, I'm the only one in the picture because everybody else is sorry, finished the finish line. But he said I couldn't crush that spirit. So you, every year track came up, do you want to run track? And I would be yes. And he'd be like, okay, here we go again. <laughs> so that's him on the sidelines there in the green shirt green jacket. Uh, in the outcomes, we ended up qualifying and incorporating representation from a lot of these respective categorizations. Some firms hold multiple categorizations, like I'm a minority as well as a small business. So the counts aren't unique, but it gives us a, I don't think we need to diminish the value of women businesses versus small business or whatever. This is the whole complement. Of course, when we report our numbers, we have to report them in metrics that kind of make sense and kind of add up. So you got to pick one and kind of categorize them towards that. But there was an impact there with the firms that we worked with. And we exceeded the goal uh, up to 32%. And again, like I said, it was aspirational. It's not necessarily, a, there's no retribution or any any issue with not achieving the goal, but doesn't wouldn't look good for the organization. And they definitely wanted to be more successful than the last project. So Paul and his era of the previous project ended up uh, setting the bar a little higher for me the second time around. Is that you holding up the sign? Yes, I like to hold up the sign. So I got that same thing, so I'm holding the... Yeah, so that's me. I like to, I have a bunch of pictures of things I'm holding up. Um, and what are the outcomes? For me, the outcomes were it's a continuum of success in the project that the Spurs represent as an organization. And it's not just the Spurs, but to be the leaders in that arena of providing that platform to give me space to be able to voice my objections or my concerns with the delivery. It reduces a lot of disenfranchisement that happens within our community, whether San Antonio was being cut out of the picture as a community at large, that was part of the discussion. Again, the smaller segments of that being women businesses, small businesses, pairing those up, we were able to break those barriers a lot. Um, AT&T Center, whether you realize it or not, is actually a community asset and actually has a responsibility to the community to be accessible to the community for public events. So they have a commitment as operators of the facility to also serve the community for certain types of things as a support facility to the community. Peter Holt, who opened this whole box up and made it an edict at the first project. The county named the, their uh, program award in his honor. Um, it's continued to develop mentor relationships. A lot, of, some of y'all in the room, I've met through this program and we've developed relationships and part of it has gotten me to where I am today with my firm. Um, there's a new entrepreneur center going in for the entire region with the county. So there's an entrepreneur center which is going to serve all of ACOG, which is our Alamo area council of governments. So all our adjoining counties. And so it's going to have a bigger reach and a bigger platform. And as part of this, which was kind of different and didn't, when we talked to the county representative, she was looking for a platform to create the second chance fair, which was the first time they had done it. So during the construction of this project, we hosted a second chance fair to recruit outcoming convict, uh, convicted people that were coming out of the jail system to find opportunities within the project to get hired in the trades. And so we hired, I think, a handful of people. I think two of them are still employed with 
uh, like our electrical farms and stuff. So it was a great thing and it's continued over the years. Questions, comments, thoughts? Sure. You mentioned you had to put together the team, the uh, local, right? That was mm -hmm. the focus, was trying to get local. Yes. And they had that comment that said, well, you're not big enough, you don't have enough. How much of a challenge was that? Was that, or maybe it wasn't a challenge. And then the other thing is I was going to ask you is, you have a, this is who we prefer, you like this company, do you have a backup? Mm -hmm. It may not work out. Yeah, so uh, I'll answer the last question first. So the question of, you know, did we have backups and stuff? I met over 1,800 individual contacts during the course of the outreach. I have a list that I still hold today. Uh, it represented firms from all over the nation, a lot of them local, but a lot of firms from all over the nation. And so when I brought talent or firms to the table for these contractors to consider, it was usually three and four deep. And so I didn't just give them one, I gave them a list and I said, and then I would follow up and try to make sure that they were making contacts with those firms. So we gave them options. We didn't just say, oh, go pair with this person. We gave them options and they vetted them out themselves. Um, and then the first question, I'm sorry. Um, Representing the community. Yeah, well, you said that you, you kind of came up with, and then you, you kind of answered it too, but, uh, but this other group that said, well, San Antonio just is. Oh, yeah, well, the, like the food service uh, appliance vendor, they said, well, we already have established contracts. How can we violate that? And I said, well, do you do any procurement? And if I found you a vendor that could procure certain components, would you consider that as a spend? And there was some procurement and logistics people that did the procurement of appliances. And so they put together like a million dollar package to buy pre-purchase and buy some of the appliances that they had were able to let and so they, that became spends on our side with national vendors and national contracts but it was spent locally through sure not not so much in breaking up the actual component but you know the craning the hoisting a lot of that, the transport. So I actually got to the point where we, we were providing some of those, even the day laborers that they needed maybe for just some of the packaging and handling. So they, they went to that level to commit dollars. Yeah, Joe. Mike, um, just get close. Yeah, yeah. John Baker with LAN. Question for you. If you're a company that's a prime, that's looking for these uh, talented subs, where, what are the best resources for finding them? That, like, wh where to go? That, I've heard your, I've heard hire you, but yes. uh, are, it, it is hard because when you're vetting your coordinator lead, I guess it's setting the expectations of what their role is. I saw this as my role of vetting and uh, I have an economic development background as well. So, and business uh, portfolio underwriting. So I had questions in my mind that I wanted to learn about these firms to understand if they were somebody I even wanted to bring to the table. Cause the Spurs would bring people, the county would bring people. And I was sitting there vetting them and basically being the vetter before we even got to any contracting opportunities. Uh, so I guess it's having more engagement with whoever the coordinator is, whether it is internally or externally, kind of identifying what their role and what their capabilities are to have these conversations. Because I know some of it was is challenging. Yeah, let me add to that. I think you know I, it, it, it's different in the professional service side versus the the general contracting side. Um, oftentimes, we all say uh, find the firms that are ready, willing, and able. And 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 one of the things that we always had especially on TJ side when he's, when he's dealing with the, the firms, you have to get them to understand that everybody comes out for the big $100, $200 million program. That's not necessarily in your wheelhouse. And you might need to exit that and, and start and do the $5 million. So a lot of times people come in and they're not ready, willing, and able. And some of the questions that TJ mentioned that he asked them, they were able to, you ask those specific <laughs> questions and people will leave on their own. They said, this is not for me. Not ready. I'm not ready. But 
a lot of times you have these events and you have you, you feed them and all that and everybody feels they're gonna get a piece of the pie and you gotta you, you, it's it's just no pie there for them uh, but I think being uh, finding on the professional service side is a little bit different because you know everybody's you know in these type of settings and you you can find them I, I think there's no no shortage of firms uh, but it's just being able to be aggressively both sides for the small businesses and for the large businesses aggressively wanting to make that marriage come together it's challenging yeah not all of them were successful but there was a platform to figure out that as well so mm-hmm. um, TJ, i've got a TJ, question is, oh, go ahead that's just like TJ. Oh, this online. Is Jeff Habershro. Yeah, this is Jeff Habershro. Hey, Jeff. I'm up in Austin this yes, morning, so good to see you. Good to see you. Good to see you. Hey, uh, talk to uh, me a little more yeah. about the uh, grievance committee that you formed, and you touched very briefly on it, but I'd like to hear more about how you brought that group together, a little bit more of the makeup and some of the execution. Uh, so we would have a regular meeting of our internal group. Part of the, the agenda was to have any grievances as part of the agenda items. If we were uh, suspecting there was challenges or somebody wanted to have, usually it was coming from the small business or the minority business wanting to air out a grievance. So we would give them an opportunity to come into that monthly meeting or, or whatever the timing was. If it had to be done special, then we would do it special. But basically we had a regular meeting amongst the, all the team leads for the respective representation and give that platform and then set some time frames for us to follow up. So a lot of time the follow up was for me to follow up with the prime or the subcontractor that they were prime to or sub to and figuring out what the mismatch was, what the problems were, what the challenges were and try to figure out if there was an equitable solution to come to a resolution to reset expectations, to move forward or to cut the relationship off and in some cases, it was just trying to help facilitate some of the communication and the expectations, and that sometimes they restructured their, one of them, they restructured their contract because it wasn't fitting the role of the sub to the, the main uh, contractor, and, and there was a mismatch there, so they restructured their contract. The other one is there was really no good faith on the subcontractor that was letting the work to the smaller entity to really have a good relationship, and so it was just decided we would pull him off the project close his contract, but we expected him to be fulfilled because we felt it was the prime contractor's responsibility to have been operating in good faith. And so they needed to make sure that that contract was whole. So we didn't let them walk away from the contract without a penalty, if you will, I guess, for their bad behavior. So how did you manage the uh, outreach for that, letting letting the trades know that that committee existed or how could they get access to it? What was the, what was the governance? Uh, as far as like why we were doing that no or more like how we did how how you were how you were able to um uh provide information that uh other trade partners knew that they had access to that that grievance committee uh well that was very open book i had open access to everybody but as a leader uh hunt acom had very strong contract language and Ultimately, uh, when I reported to the gentleman was Sid Perkins, who's still in their operations, um, he literally had the the clout to tear up the contract, and he did. He tore up the demolition contract, prime contract, because they were not letting work to the small businesses. So he sat him in a room and tore up their contract and said, we're going to start over. <laughs> and he said, and if you want to sue me, I am a principal in the company, and I'm willing to put the reputation of my company behind it so we can see you in court or we can find a solution. And that I don't know that's the circumstance for everybody because that's a pretty tough position, but that that was the ultimate position I had at, at my disposal for enforcement. Thanks, appreciate it. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. I have one real quick. Sure. Man, what stress to be able to finish a project completely, you know, to allow the Spurs to do their preseason. Did you have a contingency plan or anything like that? Was it John, was it John Jay High School gym or, you know, I mean, what, what, what was there in place? There was. I, I wasn't aware of one, but I'm not sure. 
first one was, was actually for them to hurry up and lose. So that, <laughs> that, was, that was a contingency plan. Hurry up and lose because yeah, four and a half months. Are, four and a half months is not a long time. You know, you you take it, it, pretty much gutted the the arena, right? Everything. We took Everything. all the seats out, Everything. ground Everything. the concrete to a and, uh, polished concrete floor, yeah. and. And we, we mentioned in Nashville that they didn't make the playoffs the year before the start of the project. So that was. Yeah, that was, yeah, that was, that, that was, was what you were hoping. That was big. That was big. That was big. Yeah, that was, they had, they had five championships at that time, I think already. So, you know, we were saying, okay, you got enough now. Lose so that we can, lose so that we can uh, renovate your building so you can prepare for some other ones, right? Yeah. So no yeah. contingencies, you know of them. What they would that do was, just that was not, that was just that that end date was locked, mm -hmm. you know. And I mean, Acom Hunt was, you know, I've been looking at the same thing that you know we 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 perform miracles, but you know if it would have been four months or three months and three three months and three and a half months, it would have been difficult. Yeah, that would have been difficult. Yeah, yeah. But you know, people be standing in the arena. Yeah. yeah. Thank goodness. Thank goodness. Alma don't maybe. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That that probably would have been, but no one had that contingency. No one had. It was never set saying if we don't, because that would have given uh, an out, given yeah. given them an out. So. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. So, you know, owners and agencies say that they advocate for small businesses, minority businesses, and they usually view that advocacy as providing opportunities. But as the, the industry is moving more to qualifications based selections from low bidding, qualified qualified bidding, things mm -hmm. of that nature, do these owners and agencies have a responsibility to, to teach the small business how to be successful, getting those opportunities, and you know, putting together successful proposals, and that has different applications across different types of contracts. But, Yes. I when I work for an agency, it's I always felt it was incumbent of us to t to teach them how to how to win work when it's not just a you know a low bid environment. Yes, it's a harder lift, but yes, there 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 is an aspect of of how far do you take it. Some programs are much more vested in the success as a ultimate success of growing, because in my mind the goal and expectation is to grow out of the program. This shouldn't be the only mechanism for you to be in business. It should be to grow and and become a viable business. And so, if you're going to do that, you have to invest more than just oh, we have a program and a policy. It's do we have an infrastructure and a support, and even having the the community contractors as part of that as part of the support structure that are not in that community, not to create opportunity, but to help build the business capacity of those firms and educate. Yes, and, mm -hmm. and 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 I think one of my slides I probably blew past it was sometimes it's seen as a burden instead of an opportunity, and sometimes the burden is your organization isn't structured to mentor, so you don't have that mindset or that culture, and it is a very difficult thing when you're asking a project team to figure out how to mentor a, a firm because they're not structured that way. I mean, we had demolition training days. The general superintendent, as as I mentioned, said there were days that those small subs before they started, you said every one of you is going to bring every one of your subs out here and every one of you is going to learn how to properly take down a wall given our policies and our procedures and all y'all are going to go to a specific spot in this building and we're going to tear down a wall together. And he went through every step and procedure and he said if you're not here and your people are not here, you're not starting on this project. So it was things like that that made an impact. Well, I hope we gave you a good presentation this morning. Great. Thank you. Yes. Thanks, Paul. Good job. Good job. All right. Well. All right. Uh, appreciate you guys being here. Thank you all for coming again. Uh, thanks everybody for being here. Uh, we uh, we've got uh, who's coming in March. Uh, Julio, people. Airport Solutions is coming back in March. So they were here last year, uh, last spring. That was a really good program. Uh, so. We'd like to see a full house for that again. Um, 
Uh, we are, if anybody wants to sponsor the next meeting, uh, that is available. Uh, so wanted to uh, again thank uh, Hill for sponsoring this month and uh, Foster actually sponsored last month, but I forgot to mention it. So uh, just so happens Paul's here, so it worked out. Um, and then anything just, you know, kind of looking at a little bit in the future, we'll do our Christmas in July again. Uh, we'll we, we still got some time for that. That's been a good event um, uh, to get. Uh, we had two big trash bags full of toys we got to take to the uh, facility in uh, Floresville, so that was good. Um, and then we will have the clay shoot coming in August. So we'll be reaching out with that in a couple months. Uh, thing is we are looking at, uh, John has been pushing, putting together a CCM training here in San Antonio. Uh, there will be up to about 20 seats, so we're looking for that. There's information uh, in, your, in your pamphlets. So we're hoping to do that late spring or sometime this spring. So the next three, what's that? Early spring. We'll hope, hope early spring so sometimes the next two to five months we'll be doing this hopefully <laughs> hopefully more like three but uh you'll see that bat signal go out soon uh thank you john for for doing a good job pushing on that um and then we'll get that out to you there is a cost for that that's uh yeah uh, so i want to bring up more about focus too last year we sponsored focus mm -hmm. and i think we did a really really excellent job in, in participating with focus here in san antonio and some people seemed real happy at national too as well um and mr foster if, if i'm right you're a founder or what is that um just a fellow a fellow there you go he's a fellow for cmaa too as well so that's a great honor to to have and, and to be one so Thank you, sir, for being here. I really appreciate it. And then uh, if we can, you know, so since we did such a good job last year, babe, if you can get to um, Philadelphia, that would be a good plus for CMAA to participate. Yep. Thank yep. you, Jay. Thanks, John. All right. All right, y'all have a good one.